Awesome. Awesome. Great. Well, good to see you all. Um, in case you don't know who I am, my name is Charles Bobo. I'm the youth pastor here uh, at Great Oaks. And thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, awesome. I just want to firstly thank Pastor David for just allowing me to be up here in the first place. Can we give it up for him? He's listening live right now. So make some noise for him. Make some noise for him. Awesome. And also, welcome everyone online. We're so glad you're here. I was looking for the camera. It's right over there in that corner. Good to see you all. Glad you joined us today. Um, man, well, I'm really excited to be here. I have some life updates for you. Um, about a month ago, um, I was able to have the awesome joy and privilege to, to get married to my beautiful wife, Brooke. And so she's right there at the front. So it was a, 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 just a beautiful, beautiful wedding day. I have a picture for you. I did bring a picture for you. There you go. There's us. <laughs> she looks beautiful. Um, we, yeah, we've been married for about a month now, and uh, it's just been a joy. And we, we were able to go take a little bit of a, a trip to Dominican Republic for our honeymoon, which is a blast. Um, there were so many adventures we got to go on. We shared just fantastic experiences, just enjoy exploring the country. And we're just excited to be back here in, in San Antonio. So uh, you all have the honor to hear me officially say that sitting in the front here is my smoking hot wife. And so here she is. She's here in the very front row. Um, that's the first time I can say that now. So you're welcome. Um, but real quick, I, ha I have a question for y'all. Um, raise your hand if you took some vacation this, this summer. Raise your hand if you took some vacation. Okay. Awesome, great, you had some good vacations. Hopefully well rested, you're able to get back in the flow of the new semester. Uh, has anyone ever taken a, a, a vacation to like a tropical place before? Okay, raise your hand if you have, a tropical place. Beautiful, all right, it's just an amazing experience. And so um, I think you just saw some of the photos up there, but I'll show them again. Uh, the, we went to Dominican Republic for, for a week and we got to just experience this place that was just tropical, it's vibrant, the colors are amazing. You can put the pictures up again, yeah, there you go. We went horseback riding, we got to do a bunch of things in the Dominican Republic and really experience their culture. And so these photos um, are, were taken on a film camera. I have like a little hobby. I have an old film camera from 1975 and I would go around and take photos. And so um, it was really fun. We got to explore just this awesome countryside, uh, could see the, the, the community, the culture, experience it firsthand. And we, we got to do all these things together. Like, and if you have been on a, trop in a tropical place before, it's, it's a blast, right? You're like, man, there's fruit. And we got to go to like this, this, uh, this, this cocoa bean farm where they made you know, cocoa beans and they made coffee. And we got to try these little coffee beans and there's fresh fruit and we're just like picking fruit and trying it fresh. And we're like, man, this is a blast. <laughs> this is how God intended for it to be, you know? <laughs> so um, we're just experiencing this. Like, man, this is a blast. And so if you guys know, like, after a vacation, the last day, okay, you're coming back. You're, we found ourselves, right, after eight days, we're packing our bags, and we're boarding the plane to, to fly out of Dominican Republic. We, we land in San Antonio, and we're taking the Uber back to, back to our apartment. Now, coming back to a place like San Antonio, like, directly after being in, like, colorful mountains, right, after being in luscious, fruitful places, right? It's like, it's a difficult experience, okay? <laughs> Has anyone experienced this feeling after a vacation? Okay, great. I'm, I'm not alone, right? Now, now think about it, right? Like, landing in a place that's like flat, that's like hot, and is like an ongoing biblical plague of mosquitoes year-round, like, it's not a thrilling experience, okay? Right? But, but now, Brooke and I, we're, we're immediately back here in San Antonio, and, and we're, 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 we're about to start the day-to-day -day pace of our, of our new married life, okay? Who here remembers their first stages of their married life, right? You're, 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 getting, you're learning the quirks. You're like, okay, you do that. Okay, like, what is this? And so we, we get back into to our, our place together, and we start facing our first many challenges as a couple, right? We're, so she comes in, and when we have this, this apartment. Okay, how do we want to decorate this apartment, right? And so she wants to decorate the, the apartment like, you know, baskets and like, dried flowers and like boho, you know, like that kind of theme. And I'm coming in like, I want minimalist. I want like one picture frame on the wall, like, you know, <laughs> clean lines and solid colors, you know? <laughs> I'm just like, I need my sanity, right? <laughs> Some of you hear that and you're like, I would lose my sanity you know, in a place like that. So we're trying to figure this out. Like there's a challenge and, and we're trying to figure out how do I shop for groceries, right? And so she wants to make like a, like a quinoa salad, right? <laughs> like, I want to make a salad of quinoa. And I'm like, dude, I'm ready to like dig into some ribs and mac and cheese. Like, uh, give, me, give me brisket mac and cheese, please. <laughs> like, please. And so we're trying to figure that out. And then we're like, okay, so like, how do we end our night? She's ready to go to bed at like eight, right? She's like, I'm, I'm, I'm tapped out. <laughs> and I'm, I got the popcorn, I got the blanket. I'm like, dude, I'm ready to start a movie. <laughs> like, let's go. And so can anyone relate to that? Raise your hand if you can relate to that. Okay, you're sitting next to them. You're like, I know this person. <laughs> next to me, right? And so 
We're, we're, we're experiencing these small mini challenges, right? These silly little challenges that we face, right? Like right after we have this like amazing experience, like mountaintop experiences, right? We had this experience in the, in the vibrant places of, of Dominican, and then we come back and it's just like challenges, right? It's just challenges, right? And so, so why am I sharing this? Well, one, I want to, y'all to hear about my cool stories. But secondly, <laughs> right, sec- primarily, the reason I'm sharing this today is because I believe that there are, there are many Christians here today in this room. There are many Christians here around us and in the world today that are going through wilderness experiences. They're going through moments of their faith journey where they just have like this mountaintop experience with Jesus. They just have this this moment with God that is just like, he is just so amazing. And I'm just like in this place that's fruitful and I'm just like enjoying God. Like it's, it's amazing. And then just directly after that, we experience what feels like a spiritual wilderness. And there's a lot of us in this room who have experienced moments in our life and maybe are currently experiencing a moment where we feel spiritually dry, just dry on the inside. Like where has the inspiration gone? Where has the voice of the Lord gone? Why does it feel he's gone? Why do I feel empty? And there's just, it feels like we're just enduring like this, this, this spiritual like wasteland. And I, I just, I sense this and that there's, there's, there's those of us in this room who feel just spiritually depleted in our like relationship with God, but we're also still facing like ongoing battles with temptation and sin habits. And we're just, we're, 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 we're facing this. And so this leaves many of us in this room to ask questions like, like what, what happened? Like, where did it go wrong? What did, did I do something wrong? Like, where, where is, where is God? Has anyone experienced moments like this before in their faith journey? Please be honest. Okay, amen, great. Well, firstly, I want you to know, as you just saw, you are not alone. You're not alone. And it doesn't make you bad, <laughs> in fact. And a lot of us think that because I'm going through a difficult season in my life, that means I did something wrong. And very seldom is that the case. Very seldom is it that we're being punished for something that we did wrong. But what I want to encourage you with today, believers, is that we're firstly going to read a a story about Jesus being led into the desert for 40 days without food, water, and, and he's about to be tempted by Satan himself. And so the good news I have for you all today is this, that you are not alone, but it's important to know that experiencing spiritual wilderness is a major part of the Christian life experiencing wilderness seasons where it feels like, man, where is God? Where has he gone? That is so crucial to our walk in faith in Jesus. And it is not something that we can bypass. And there's a strong urge in the Christian culture today to where anything that becomes difficult, we want to bypass and skip it. But we're not called to live like that. Jesus doesn't even live like, well, like that. The disciples, the first followers of Jesus didn't even live like that. But there's this urge in us today that any ounce of discomfort that I'm experiencing means that I need to get out of it. But Jesus calls us to say, hey, I've not called you to live a comfortable life. I've called you to be uncomfortable for my name's sake. This is how Jesus has called us to live. And so today, we are going to read this story in Matthew 4. Matthew 4. Flip to your Bibles today in Matthew chapter 4. And as you're flipping there, I just want to provide some context for you. We just had this mountaintop experience that is shown in in Matthew chapter 3. And what we see here is that John the Baptist baptizes Jesus in in, in chapter 3 just before. And and it's this amazing experience. In case some of you may or may not know, John the Baptist is Jesus' cousin. And so he's the guy with like hair, you know, just like he's, he's covering himself with camel's hair. He eats bugs for a living and he's got dreads. He's like that guy, you know. So he's just, he's there, right? And so that, that's Jesus' cousin, right? And so he's, and here's, what's, here's what makes John the Baptist such a cool character, right? We have all the prophets in the, in the Old Testament, right, who are talking about Jesus coming one day. He's coming soon. Here he comes, right? And that's all the prophets in the Old Testament preparing a way for Jesus, but John the Baptist, what makes him such a unique prophet compared to all the others is that he has the opportunity to say that he is here. He has come now. All the other prophets are saying, Jesus is coming one day. John the Baptist is the guy that gets to say he's here now. And so, so John the Baptist is like, okay, like, I, hey, Gabriel, Jesus is here. The Messiah, the promised one is here. Up comes Jesus, 
and he's asking John to baptize him. And John is like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, I, I am not worthy to baptize you. Are you serious? Like, I, I don't even know if I can even unstrap your, your sandals. Like, you're, you're literally the God of the universe. And he says, no, I need you to baptize me. And so, so John pulls Jesus into, 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 into the waters of the river, of the Jordan River, and he takes him, he dunks him. Jesus comes up. And this powerful moment takes place where we see the Trinity in the, same, in the same place at once. We have the Son, the Holy Spirit just descends on Jesus like a dove, it says in Scripture. And then we hear this booming voice from heaven saying, from, from God the Father saying, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. This is a powerful moment. So we literally see the Son, Holy Spirit coming down, Father speaking clear as day. And you're like, wow, this is, a, this is a powerful, powerful moment that just takes place in Scripture. And so it's like, it's all in the same place. And then right after this, we're about to jump into the story. And so many of us remember moments like this, right? Remember moments like this in our story where we just felt like God was so clear. I heard God clear. I heard Him move powerfully. I remember having this encounter with the Holy Spirit. And I remember speaking with the Father. And I remember experiencing what it was like for the Son to take His life and give it away so I could live. It's like we remember these moments and this is what happens next in the story. And so let's pray before we read the scriptures. And so, Lord, we ask that you just speak to us clearly today through your word. God, we humble ourselves before you. God, we ask that it would be you that we're after. Lord, change our hearts. Whatever parts of our hearts, Lord, you want to draw closer to you, just draw us close today. Following you is the greatest calling of our life. Nothing else matters except you. And so, God, we love you and thank you. And we pray this in your mighty name. And everyone together said? Amen. Amen. Okay, Matthew 4, verse 1. I'm in the NASB today. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he became hungry. Pause. Who led Jesus into the wilderness? The Spirit did. <laughs> the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. Like, okay, wait, pause, hold on, wait. So you're telling me that the, the Holy Spirit, who knows everything, right? Who knows, he's part of, the, he's God, like three in one, right? We're talking about a, tri a triune God. He knows what's about to happen in the desert. And the Spirit is leading Jesus into the, the wilderness to be tempted? Like we think about, like pause, think about that. Like, like why, why would the Spirit lead Jesus into the wilderness? And some people look at this verse and, and, and immediately skepticism rises. Like, okay, so why would he lead them, like people into the wilderness to be tempted and to sin? Like that sounds like a messed up God. <laughs> it sounds like a God who wants his people to fail. And many of us in this room, I sense, have this view of God, where we think that, that God is tempting us to sin or feel like God wants to watch us fail. And maybe there's a lot of us in this room who have wrestled with that in the past about God. Like, I think he wants me to fail. Like, I don't think he wants me to actually win against whatever temptations I'm facing. But James writes, he writes this letter to the Jewish Christians, and he says this in, in James chapter 1, verse 12. He says this, he said, Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive a crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Verse 13, check this out. No one is to say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted by what? When he's carried away, enticed by his own lusts. And so when lust has been conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's run its course, it brings death. And so what is this saying? When temptation comes into our lives, we need to recognize that where it comes from is sinful desires and from attacks from the enemy. That is where temptation to sin comes from, and not from God. And so the question still remains, okay, so, so why did the Spirit lead Jesus into the wilderness? And some people think, like, he, Jesus needs some character development, like, he needs, like, to grow. You know, it's, it's, it's like, he's Jesus. <laughs> he's, he's Jesus. There's something important to note. Right after the 40 days in the wilderness, what happens? After the 40 days of the wilderness, Jesus' ministry starts. His ministry begins. Like, he starts. He begins the, the mission and the journey to rescue and save all of humanity. Like, that's what happens after the 40 days. And so, so keep in mind, like, right, like, 
the reason that the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness was a test of his faith to prove that this is the Son of God. This is the Son of God. And here is the proof. Because keep in mind, like, like that Jesus is fasting in, in the wilderness. His point of, to be out there is to, is to fast and to seek God. And, and the first 40 days, Satan doesn't come. He's there praying. He's seeking God. He's preparing for the ministry that's about to start of rescuing humanity. And so he, the, the reason that this happens, right? Like he's, the, God is leading his people through testing. Like God will lead us through tempting, testing. So what we learn from God about these verses here is that God will always test us, but God will never tempt us. God will test his people, but he will not tempt his people. There is a major difference between being tested and being tempted. These are two different things. And many of us, when we experience wilderness seasons of times of temptation, we think that it's, 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 it's God tempting us. A test is an opportunity for us to show the results of our faith. A temptation is a trap designed for our faith to fail. This is the difference between a test and a temptation. They're different. And it's important that we realize this as Christians, that the wilderness is the place for testing, where where our faith is tested, but our flesh is tempted. That is the point of the wilderness season that we face as Christians. The point, and when we go through these seasons, our faith is going to be tested by God, but our flesh is going to be tempted by the enemy. And it's very important that when, like if you're in the room today, right, and you feel like you're in a spiritual wilderness, my hope for you is that you would see the wilderness season as an opportunity to show the results of what the Holy Spirit has done in your life on the mountaintop. And this is what Jesus was going through had this powerful moment with the Holy Spirit, immediately plunged into what like, feels like 40 days of, of torture, right? Of challenge. And that season of being in the wilderness for 40 days was the test to prove that what just happened on the mountaintop was real. It was true. And that Jesus Christ is, in fact, the Son of God. Amen. This is what the point of the wilderness season was. And so, what happens in verse 2? So Jesus becomes hungry. Verse, verse 2 says that it wasn't until after 40 days and 40 nights of fasting and prayer that Satan comes to tempt Jesus right when he becomes hungry. Like right when he becomes hungry, Satan approaches Jesus. It's almost as if Satan was waiting for like the right, just the right moment when Jesus was at his weakest to tempt him. And so Christians, I think it's really important that we know this, that we will be tempted the strongest when we are at our weakest. We are going to be tempted strongest when we are at our weakest point. And so here's the thing. There's a lot of times when we think that like like Satan is going to like tempt me like like immediately after I had this crazy encounter with God. Satan is not going to tempt you when you are most close with God. He's going to catch you in that one moment when you're weak. And the moments after a long day of work when we feel lonely, when we feel feel sad, when we feel stressed, when we feel tired, when we feel bored, I want you to know, Christians, expect temptation. Expect it. Expect temptation for anger to rise up towards your family members. Expect temptation to think selfishly, not self, think selflessly for others. Expect the temptations to go to this one place to feel satisfaction again. Expect temptation when we're at our weakness. Expect it. And the challenge for us is to never let our guard down. That's when the enemy slips in. And what's most challenging for the world today and for the Western culture is that there are many instances based on the way that our life structure is framed where there are places and thoughts that we go to that cause us to let our guard down. And we completely forget about everything that happened on the mountain. There's moments in our life like that and the enemy is not going to try and catch us when we're so caught up in looking at Jesus in wonder. He's going to catch us when there's a moment in our life when we're, we're weak and our flesh becomes hungry again. And our flesh starts to kind of crave the old things that were fun, the old things that satisfied us. The things that our, that our flesh wants to go to, but our spirit is like, no, 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 I want to go after him, right? This is the battle between our flesh and spirit. Right? Because the spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. 
The Spirit's super willing to be with Jesus. I want to have a passionate, wholehearted relationship with Jesus, but the, the, but the flesh is weak, right? It's like going to the gym, right? It's like you want to stay in that cozy bed <laughs> in the morning. You're like, it's 6 a.m. It's like the flesh is like, I want to, I want to go to bed, <laughs> right? But that thing in you, that little thing is like, no, you need to go work out. And when you go and do it, you're glad you did. <laughs> you come back and you're like, I'm so thankful I actually worked out. And day in and day out of choosing to listen to the Spirit, our relationship with Jesus begins to grow. It begins to take exponential growth, in fact. When we do make the decision to choose the Spirit's guidance over our life and not the flesh. And so, Satan is going to tempt us not right after the mountaintop experience, but he's going to wait a few weeks after you come down from your spiritual high, right? Right before you're about to pass, right before you're about to pass through the other side of the wilderness. Because right when Jesus is about to end his 40 days, Satan comes. He's like right on the edge of like, I, I made it through. I, here I am, the son of God. He's going to tempt him right at the last moment. And for many of us, making it through the, the desert season and the wilderness season, it's this close and there's that temptation. We cannot be caught up in that last temptation. We have to overcome. We have to press in to Christ. And so there's something we need to know that's about Satan is that Satan does not play fair. He wants to destroy your life. He doesn't play fair. You're in a boxing ring. You're expecting for Satan to do boxing? No, he's gonna start throwing knees and kicks. <laughs> he's gonna pick you up and start doing judo. He's gonna start, he's gonna doing stuff. Satan does not play fair. He doesn't play by the rules. He's out to destroy you. And so, remember, the wilderness season is where our faith is tested and our flesh is tempted. If God, if God allowed his children to skip over important tests in their faith journey, his children would become spoiled. Do not blame the temptations that dwell in the desert on God, and do not try to bypass important tests in your spiritual maturity. They're needed. So, so what does that mean we do? We embrace the wilderness season with fasting and prayer, yes. just like Jesus did. He did not skip over it. He embraced the wilderness. He said, he said I can eat that for lunch. <laughs> so he said, he said I, fasting and prayer is what allowed Jesus to endure the season of the wilderness. And so what happens next in, the, in this story? So, so in verse 3, the tempter came to, came to Jesus after these 40 days, right? And he said, he says, if you're the son of God, command that these stones would become bread. But Jesus answered and said, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. So Satan, firstly, he tries to tempt Jesus to prove his identity as the son of God by appealing to his bodily needs. He's like, hey man, like, he's probably saying things like, hey, you, you can still pray out here, but you like, don't have to like starve yourself. Like, you can still pray and like still get the job done. Like, you're good, right? Or like, you don't have to prove that you're the son of God by starving yourself. Like, that doesn't prove anything. Everyone can try and starve themselves. You just have to turn these stones to bread. And you're like, there you go. You're the son of God, right? Just prove, just prove that you're the son of God. Just turn the stones to bread, right? But Jesus already knows who he is. He knows who he is. And he's remaining obedient to what the spirit led him to do. And so Christians, when temptations come into your life, it's vital that we remain grounded in what the Spirit is leading us to do. Yes. That we remain grounded in our identity as sons and daughters. Yes. That we are grounded, like we are so secure in who we are as sons and daughters. Like we're not questioning every day, am I loved? Like I know I'm loved. I know I'm a son of God. I know I'm a daughter of God. I know I'm saved and I'm entering his kingdom. I know who I am. Like that's the kind of confidence that we're called to live like as Christians every day. And if we wake up every day, I mean, if, if, if I... Every day, I, I, imagine having your father, like your dad in your life, right? And it's just like, you come to them and you're like, question like, okay, do you love me today, dad? Like, do, do you not? Like do you, like, do you, I know I'm loved by my father. I don't have to try and earn this love. I just am his son, yeah. right? And so this is the kind of confidence that we are called to live in. We know who we are in Christ. And this is what we are rooted in and what the spirit has told us to do from the beginning. And so... I love what Jesus' response to this temptation is. It's so profound. Matthew 4, 4, he says this. He says, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. He's referencing a, a passage in Deuteronomy that's just powerful. He, he's quoting scripture. And Jesus responds to this by saying that people were not designed to just merely wake up in the morning, eat food, and then go to bed and repeat. 
Like people aren't designed to just do that. According to Jesus, if we're living life to just wake up, eat Cheerios in the morning, go to work and then repeat, we're not actually living, we're just surviving. We're just surviving. Like, it is only until we like feast on the word of God and live out a vibrant relationship with God that we experience true living. That is the moment that we experience true life. And life is a vapor and, 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 and we, we are wasting our lives just surviving if the only thing we do every day is eat food and go to work. We are wasting our lives away. If the only thing we do and our only purpose in life we think is to just wake up and go to work and live life normally. Jesus says, man's not designed to just wake up and eat food and sur survive. We are designed to live on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Amen. Every word that comes from Jesus, we are designed to just consume and live out. Like, like that is what we're calling. It's like, imagine, imagine that, that we just like live our whole lives, like calling ourselves Christians. We spend no time in the word. We eat fast food to survive. And then we gaslight ourselves into believing that we are living life to the fullest. Like, like what, is, what does John 10, 10 say? Like the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I came so that they would have life and have it what? Abundantly. Like we're called to have an abundant life in Jesus. We're not called to just wake up every day and just go to work and just carry out our normal tasks as usual. We're called to have an abundant life in Jesus. Amen. So where did it all go wrong? It all went wrong when we started developing this thing that life is a grind and I have to wake up and fend for myself. But what we're called to do is not to live like that. We're called to live life abundantly. Like what does Jesus do with the Israelites when they're stranded in the desert? Like he provides manna for them every day. He says, you're, you're, you're designed to, like the only way you're gonna eat is if you depend on me for food every day. And that's our relationship with Jesus. The only way we're gonna survive our spiritual walk with Jesus and living life every day is not, de is not depending on food from Jesus that we learned last year. or We remember this one encounter that happened a long time ago, this old revelation of Jesus. We get new revelations of Jesus every day. Revelation, revelations of God, that's fresh manna. If, if we save the manna from yesterday, it's gonna go bad. So why are we expecting to live off of old manna that we heard from a, pa from a pastor years ago and not accept the manna that's right in front of us in the word? Like, this is the word of God and it gives us life. When we just took communion a few moments ago, we took the bread and the wine. Some of us were saying grape juice. It's, <laughs> it is grape juice. But Jesus poured a cup of wine. He took bread. Like, like this symbolism, right? Like Jesus breaking his body and pouring out his blood. The bread is not just a symbolism just of his, bread, of his body breaking, but we have to eat bread to live every day. Like as Christians, we have to live every day feasting on what Jesus did for us. And if we skip a day eating bread, then we're starving. And some of us are just drinking wine every day. So anyway, I love Jesus. He's just like forgiving me all the time. <laughs> and we're just... <laughs> but we all know. You cannot be sustained in your relationship with God by just drinking wine. You have to eat bread. What sustains your relationship with Jesus is not getting drunk on just his forgiveness. What sustains your relationship with him is what he's done for you every day. That is what sustains our relationship with Jesus. And so Jesus knows, okay, the bread of the word gives us abundant and purposeful life. Why would I settle for worldly bread? Why would I settle for these rocks turned to bread if I'm feasting on, on the word? <laughs> like, that's enough. We have people in other countries across the, the planet right now who have nothing but who are filled with the spirit. They're feasting on the word and they are filled with purposeful lives because they found it in Christ. That's why. And so we are not... In, or, in order to endure through the wilderness seasons, we cannot live on bread alone. We have to live on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So it's vital for us to know, Christians, that if we feast our bodies but starve our spirit, our faith will die in the wilderness. And we're designed not to just wake up every day and eat food. We are designed to live a purposeful life in Jesus and feast on spiritual food. That is why we are designed to be here on this planet and live the lives that we are living. And so what happens next in the story? Matthew 4, verse 5. And the devil took him, took him along the holy city and, and, and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. 
took Jesus to his own house, <laughs> a prayer. He put him on the very top and he said, he said, it, said to him, if you're the son of God, just throw yourself down for it's written. He quotes scripture. He will give his angels orders concerning you and on their hands, they will lift you up. They're gonna catch you. And if you do not, sh- and so that you do not strike your foot against a stone. But Jesus said to him, on the other hand, it's also written that you shall not put the Lord your God to the test, to the test. So I have a question for you, Bible nurse. Um, there's, this, <laughs> there's, there's this really famous theologian in scripture, actually. Um, so I want you to put your hats on right now. There's this famous theologian in the scripture, in the Bible, who I would say knows scripture like really, really well inside and out, um, has appeared multiple times in stories throughout scripture. Um, does anyone know who I'm talking about? Satan. <laughs> it's Satan. Satan is a very intelligent theologian. Satan is a very intelligent theologian. He's just not a good one. And here's the reality. Everyone is a theologian, but not everyone is a good theologian. We are all able to look at the scripture, to take a verse and interpret it and what makes sense into our own eyes. But not everyone is able to interpret scripture and say, why did Jesus place this here? And so who is the next person in line that knows scripture inside and out? Satan is. (laughs) The only difference is that Satan shapes the Bible to his liking and will misuse it. And it's really, it's a scary reality knowing that Satan reads our Bible more than we do. And we have to be very, very careful Christians, I want to challenge us and call us. We have to be very careful and mindful about reading scripture in context because Satan will misuse the very Bible verses that are hung up on the walls of our own houses. He will. So, and Christians, I also want to give you a very serious warning. There are influential people in the world today who are twisting scripture for their own selfish gain. There are. And if we are never reading scripture on our own time, we will never spot the difference. And these people will use our vulnerability at their expense. In fact, your job as the church, our job as the church, but your job right now today is to hold me accountable. It's to hold me accountable to preaching this correctly. And that's why we all need to be in the word is because like if, you, if, if, if we aren't in our Bible and if you aren't in your Bible, I could be preaching lies to you and you would never know. And so I give you all full permission to hold me accountable, to make sure that what I'm teaching is in its proper context. And you have full accountability to hold anyone up to this platform, all of us. And Pastor Dave will say the same thing. Like he, he reads the word. You guys know Pastor Dave, he preaches the word. He says, if, like if there's anything out of line, I'm just reading the word. Hold me accountable to it. And that is our call as Christians, to hold whoever is teaching accountable. This is why you have full access to this. You don't need someone else to interpret it for you. Like you, We do it as a community. Hold each other accountable. What is Jesus teaching us in the word? And so we need to make sure as Christians, right, we are, we are reading in the proper context. Did Satan quote actual scripture in the Bible? Yes. <laughs> yeah, he did. Did he preach it in proper context no (laughs) and this is why jesus corrects him with scripture more scripture to hold that accountable and so satan takes jesus to the temple right god's own house of worship and he tells him hey jump off god will catch you god will catch you right and what satan just did with this scripture is that he he used the scripture to convince jesus to force god to pretty much perform a magic trick he do the do a little magic he'll catch you right and if there's, some, if there's one thing <laughs> that you don't do with God, it's attempting to control him using his image bearers as leverage. It's something we don't do. And in fact, this is more of a temptation to manipulate God, not a test. <laughs> this is a, a temptation to prove himself to us on our terms. And so God will not bend to our terms. He will bend us to his. That is the truth about when we follow Jesus. And so... What happens next in the story? Verse eight, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, 
All these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, go away, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and behold, the angels came and began to serve him. In his final temptation, Satan offers Jesus an opportunity to bypass the cross. He's like, and you can have power and glory from earth. Like, if you have these things, if only Jesus would bow down and worship him. And so it seems like Satan is still in pursuit of what initially got him thrown out of heaven, heaven in the first place which is to be praised and worshiped by God himself and to be like God. But Jesus reminds Satan, God is not designed to worship us. We are designed to worship him. God is not designed to worship all of our needs and, and, and desire and all these things. We are designed to worship him. He is the one that we worship. And we don't dabble and worship into, into things of this world just to get us like, to get us further along, to get some of the things that we want here. Like we don't stoop down to that. Like Christ pulls us up out of that. And so this leaves us the question today, right? Like, and what just happened um, in, in, the, in the ending passage there, right? The devil left him and behold, the angels came and began to serve him. Jesus passed the test. He passed. He passed through the wilderness. He is the son of God. And guess who came? The angels came and helped him. It's important that we realize that as Christians, that in the testing, that God is there ushering us along. It's like a dad teaching his kid how to ride a bike, right? He's teaching his kid how to ride a bike. Does he want the bike to fall and want his son to get injured? No. Will he be there to help him when he falls? Yes. That is our father to us. He's not planning or scheming for us to fall. He wants us to, to win and succeed. And the moment we, that, that we make it through these wilderness seasons, he's there to scoop us up. Always. And so, this leaves us with a question today. What, and what does it look like for us, and how do we overcome temptation in the wilderness? What does it look like for us to endure the wilderness season and to overcome temptation? And there's four things, I think, that Matthew 4 teaches us about Jesus overcoming temptation. Matthew 4 teaches us about Jesus overcoming temptation in these ways. Firstly, Jesus overcame temptation through his power alone. Jesus overcame temptation through his power alone. In verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 10, we're told this. The temptations of your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful, and he will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. And when you're tempted, he will show you what? A way out so that you can endure so that you can endure it's vital that we see this Jesus overcame, overcame temptation on his power alone so temptation oftentimes we think that you know like God like we hear things people say things like oh God will never give us more than we can handle he will <laughs> he will <laughs> he will give us th- loads that we cannot bear that's why we need him if God didn't give us burdens that we couldn't carry, then what's the point of having him in our life? If we can carry every burden on our own. <laughs> what this means is that, what this scripture is telling us that in moments of temptation, that the enemy is tempting us, and we feel like we are at, there is a wall in front of us, and we cannot escape this temptation to go back to this thing, to go back to this sin habit. God says, there is a way out. You have to look for me. Jesus is the way out. <laughs> Christ is the way out of temptation. And it's not like this, like this, this cool trick, the this, this top 10 tips of how to like, like establish a more habitful life. It's, it's, Christ is the way out of every temptation. He is the way out. And there's nothing wrong with these, trip, these tricks and tips, but Christ is the one that knows the way out. Especially when a temptation feels like we are a brick wall and we can't escape whatever we're being tempted by. Christ is the way out. So secondly, Matthew 4 teaches us that Jesus modeled how to overcome temptation. Ephesians, at the end of Ephesians 6, 17, we know the armor of God. We've heard of the armor of God, right? Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Did you know that there's no wrong occasion to pray? <laughs> you want to know a good occasion to pray? Every. That's a good occasion. 
<laughs> and some of us think like, it's only breakfast, lunch, and dinner, or right before I eat my meal. Every occasion is the right occasion to pray. Amen. And so stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Every temptation that Jesus faced, he responded with scripture. Every single prayer, every, every single temptation in prayer, he responded, this is actually what the word of God says. Why? Because our words fall flat, but his rise above. Amen. Our Amen. words and our wisdom are so shallow. <laughs> the Lord's wisdom and his words are powerful. Yes. It's sharper than two-edged sword. Yes. It can cut through bone and marrow. Yes. That's the word of God. And so when we try to respond to temptation with like our own, our own thing, like my own logic, and I'll just do this, like it's not strong enough. We're not strong enough. The word of God is a sword. It's a two-edged sword yes. that cuts through any temptation. So what does that require of us to be ready? To be ready to draw. And that is gonna require some of us to pull out our Bibles off of our top shelf and just, just blow that thing off. <laughs> I'd encourage you, be immersed in the word. Put it on your heart. What does David write in the Psalms? I've hidden your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. I've hidden your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. The word is not just here, the word is here. And there's a lot of people in this world who know the Bible inside and out, but who do not have a personal relationship with Jesus. And it's impossible to to go our entire life knowing about the things of God but never knowing Him. Amen. And so it's vital that we, that we consume the Word not just for knowledge and to, be, to, to know things about the Bible but to actually have a fruitful walk with Jesus. The man that hung next to Jesus on the cross who was a thief, who probably had no time to read his Bible and in the last moments of, of his life said, Jesus, from his heart, remember me in your kingdom. Yes. Didn't have time to get baptized. Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. That was a heart. The Pharisees studied scripture all day long, in night and day, but their heart was hardened. The question I have for y'all today is, is your heart open to the actual word of God for your life to change? That's where it happens. So open your heart. Is that song, Open the Eyes of My Heart? Anyone know that song? <laughs> Chris Tomlin, right? <laughs> it's Chris Tomlin. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I want to see you. It's not Chris Tomlin. <laughs> I thought it was. <laughs> Either way, we know that song. <laughs> Open the eyes of my heart. Not just my mind, my heart. Allow your eyes to be opened in your heart to know Christ today. Number three, Jesus experienced humanity's temptations. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Hebrews 2, 18, this is so important that that Jesus actually, we talk about Jesus being fully God and fully man. That's what it means. It's not, Jesus was not 50% God and he was not 50% man. He was 100% God, 100% man. That it's a weird thing, right? <laughs> like how can God be 100% both things? He is. <laughs> he is 100% God, 100% man, which means that he 100% experienced the temptations that we face every day. And so what does that mean? Number four, that Jesus empathizes with our weakness. Jesus empathizes with our weakness. Hebrew 4.15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. God's not distant. <laughs> he, does, he empathizes with us. But we do, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet, he didn't sin. He did not sin. Jesus empathizes with your weakness. Whatever weaknesses that you've experienced, whatever temptations that, you, that you're going through right now, it's nothing that he's not familiar with. He knows every hair on your head. He knows every hair on our head. He knows exactly what we experience. He created the brains that even allow us to experience the emotions that we're experiencing. He knows our weaknesses. And he knows us. When I was 10 years old, I was exposed to pornography for the first time. And what happened through the years of my, of my junior high and early high school years is I developed a, a crippling addiction that ruined my life. And as I faced temptation every day, I just remember feeling 
alone, overwhelmed by the strength of temptations and feeling like I could never break out of this cycle. And after I gave my life to Jesus when I was 14, I, I became determined to, to, to break this, to break this cycle. And there, these verses that I just shared with you played a major role in my freedom story from pornography because I learned three things. And it's this verse that I shared just a moment ago in 1 Corinthians 10. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. But when you're tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. So this verse played a major role in my freedom story from pornography because I learned three things. One thing I learned was that I was not alone in my temptations. It turns out that most of my friends were struggling too. And I also learned that even temptations that Jesus experienced, he knows. He knows, but he didn't sin. <laughs> he didn't. And so second thing I learned was that as, as strong as the temptations felt, as impossible as it felt, I learned that God will never force me into a position to sin against him. And some of us feel that way, that I'm being forced into a position where I'm gonna have to sin against God. And that, that I'm here to tell you that that temptation has a tendency to cast a big shadow. <laughs> it's usually just a small thing with this massively projected shadow. And what I learned was that there is always an escape route to temptation. And every temptation was an opportunity, uh, an opportunity for me to seek to find him and to find that way out. And after lots of accountability and prayer and developing healthy habits, the Lord set me free from this addiction when I was 16 years old. And by his grace, I was able to enter into a marriage one month ago completely free from this, from this addiction for seven years. And so, and by his grace, I also now have the privilege to travel across the country and speak at colleges and schools and events about the harmful effects of pornography. And so, but maybe you're here today and you're just like, you, you've had like a problem with God. Like maybe you're just upset, you're frustrated with him right now and you're, you're, in, you're, you're wondering why you're in the season of wilderness where you're being tempted. And if that's you today, I want you to know this, that, that God will always test us, but he will never tempt us. You're going through a season of testing. Press into fasting and prayer and trust in him. Maybe, you, maybe you're in this room and you've been a Christian for a while. Maybe you've been here for a long time, but, but you feel like you're struggling with a sin right now that you can't break free from. And there's just this thing that's just, just destroying you inside and out, day in and day out. And it's, it, it feels like a secret and you, you just can't be honest and vulnerable about it. I want you to know today, if that's you, I wanna encourage you, confess your sin to someone. Confess to someone your struggles. Hold firmly to the word of God. And remember that there is always a way out. Yes. Always. There's always a way out. No matter how, no matter how just how thick that concrete wall feels in a moment of temptation, there is always a way out. And every temptation is an opportunity for us to seek him. So see temptation as that, an opportunity for me to press into God and to confess and put that thing in the light. I can't hide in the darkness put it in the light. And lastly, maybe you're here today, and, but you're not a believer. Maybe you're just kind of experiencing and trying to learn this church thing. You're not really sure what you believe yet. You feel like maybe no, no one understands what you're going through or even what you are currently going through, what you've been through. And maybe you feel stuck today and you're struggling. If that's you today, I want you to know this, that Jesus empathizes with your weakness. Jesus empathizes with you. And the only way out of temptation is through Christ alone. And he can set you free today. And so what we do here at Great Oaks is we present an invitation for anyone who wants to say yes to Jesus and begin their pursuit and their walk with Christ. And we wanna open this opportunity for you. And so what I'm gonna ask everyone to do today is to just bow your head and close your eyes. And we're just gonna pray today. And you, if, if you're in the room today and you are ready to give your life to Jesus, you're ready to begin this journey of following Jesus. You've been, you've been a Catholic, you've, you've, you've been through these different faith journeys, and, but you wanna be serious about following Jesus today. 
I ask you to just pray this prayer after me. And, and believers, let's pray this together with them. Say this, dear Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. But right now, with the faith that you've given me, I put it in you. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you rose from the dead on the third day. And right now, I'm asking you to save me. Forgive me. Please fill me now with your Holy Spirit. And I make you the Lord and the boss of my life. In Jesus' name, I ask this in faith. Amen. And right now, begin to thank him for saving you. And if you just pray that prayer, you meant that in faith. Uh, we're not going to make you do anything strange, but we are the believers and we celebrate people that give their life to Jesus. And so if that was you, I'm going to ask you to just raise your hands on the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. If that was you, just raise your hands today. Raise your hands. Anyone this morning? Beautiful. Well, hello, believers. <laughs> Good to see you all. <laughs> Beautiful. I'm going to ask everyone to stand this morning as we close. God has called each of us to walk in freedom. Amen? He's called, to walk, called you to walk in freedom. Endure the wilderness season. We are all called to go through the wilderness season, and we are all called to overcome temptation. The only way we're making it is through Christ alone. Amen? Amen. So let me just dismiss you all and empower you with a prayer as you go this morning. So Lord, we just ask that over this body of believers today, that you would encourage them and empower them with the Holy Spirit. God, I pray that they would just be filled with direction and guidance from the Holy Spirit. Lord, as they are just led into moments of their life and their seasons, Lord, where they are going through the wilderness, Lord, I pray that you would sustain their relationship and their faith with you. God, I pray that you, by your power, Lord, you would encourage them and affirm them every step of the way. God, any temptation that they are facing, we speak against it in the name of Jesus. Lord, that they would be filled with the word of God to respond to it, God, with truth. And so, Lord, I pray that you would encourage, affirm, and uplift every believer in this house this morning. And so, God, we love you and thank you, and we pray this in your mighty name. And everyone together said? Amen. Amen. Awesome. We love you. Great. Have a good Sunday.